Thank you, Brother Willoughby, and good evening, everyone. Praise the Lord. And as uh, Brother Willoughby has mentioned, in the second hour, I'm going to take questions. If you have questions over the things we talked about last night or the things we talk about tonight. And perhaps the best way to do it, if you would write down your question, and that way maybe there's several of the same nature, I can look at them and, and uh, try to answer the questions for you. Tonight, you've received a handout called The Gospel of Jesus Christ. And also, I think perhaps you've received some pages on baptism of water and baptism of the Spirit. Now, I cannot cover all of these in uh, exact detail, but I give you the notes so that you can, uh, it will help you. But I still think it's very important for you to take your own notes and make sure uh, that you understand and write down what's important. And also, we're going to try to just go straight through teaching and then the questions, and then we may be able to end a little bit earlier, uh, maybe about 9.30 or so. And that will make it easy for transportation. Is that what we want to do? Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to start by going to Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through verse 17. This is the key passage, the theme of the book of Romans, by the way. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and verse 17. We'll take a look at this. Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So tonight I want to talk to you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now I think most of you understand this, but I want to make sure that we get the foundation right. Just as we talked about last night, the foundation is so important. And not only for your own sake, but so that you will be able to share it with someone else. And I hope that after tonight that you can meet any, anyone from any religion or no religion and in a few minutes' time, you can explain to them the basis of Christianity, the basis of what we believe and how someone can be saved. And also that you can take someone from another Christian denomination that may already have their ideas of what salvation consists of, and you will be able to share with them uh, the plan of salvation is much more beautiful and exciting than maybe what they uh, knew before. And I want to emphasize something that I mentioned last night. We're not here to attack people of other Christian groups. Uh, we're not here to fight against them. Uh, in fact, we're not trying to go against other doctrines. What we're trying to do is teach and preach the doctrine of the Bible. And uh, we believe that by sharing a good understanding of Scripture, then that will help eliminate incorrect or false views and it will let the true to, to go forward. Uh, and, you know, they teach you, uh, in somebody that works in banks, they, they teach them to be careful about counterfeit money, fake money. How do you learn what is false or fake? Well, you don't study all the kinds of counterfeit money. That will lead to confusion. But you study the true currency, and you handle it over and over and over again so that when you see or touch something false, you instinctively recognize, wait a minute, this feels different. This looks different. This is not right. So instead of trying to attack every idea that's out there, if we will preach and teach what is true and get it deeply in our hearts, then when something comes along that's not true, we'll say, wait a minute, that's not right. That doesn't match what I see in the Scriptures. That doesn't match what I feel in my heart. And we'll understand the truth. And so tonight we're talking about the truth about the gospel. Notice the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And salvation means deliverance from all the power and effects of sin. Now some of these things are not in your notes, so you have to write them down. But salvation is deliverance from all the power and effects of sin. 
Some of the benefits we receive now, some of the benefits we will receive in eternity. For example, right now we can receive forgiveness of sin. Right now we can receive power to live a holy life. Uh, and right now we can receive healing for our body. But maybe we won't receive all healing because one day we'll die. But whatever we don't receive in this life, we will receive in the life to come. So there will be perfect healing in the life to come. There will be complete deliverance from the nature of sin. Even though we have victory over sin in this life, we still have the battle with the flesh. The old nature is still with us. We still have temptation. But when the Lord comes for His church, we will be transformed into His likeness. And we will receive complete deliverance from all the power and effects of sin. We will receive a glorified body. So we will receive perfect healing and wholeness. So everything that we lost through sin, we will gain. We will more than regain in Jesus Christ. So salvation covers everything. It covers the whole person, body, soul, and spirit. That's why we preach physical healing. That's why we preach uh, emotional and mental healing. And uh, that's why we preach spiritual healing from sin. Because salvation is for the whole person. Salvation is past, present, and future. We can say, I was saved from sin. We can say, I am saved from sin. And we can say, I shall be saved from sin. Because it's past in that we're forgiven of all of our past sins. They're washed away. But it's also present in that today I can have victory over sin. I can receive power to say no to temptation. But it's still future. Because as I mentioned already, we still wrestle with the sin nature, with temptation. And so salvation still awaits us in the future. It's past, present, and future. But notice the key to receiving this great work of salvation in all the dimensions that I've described is by faith. The just shall live by faith. Now notice faith is not just one point in time. Faith is a relationship. It's very important to understand that because many people have this idea, well, you make a confession of faith and it's done. You're saved. And then some go on to say you can never be lost even if you go back into a life of sin. You, you made that confession of faith 10 years ago and so you're automatically saved. The Scriptures do not teach this. The Scriptures teach that we're saved by faith that is present and continuous it's a relationship. Notice, to everyone that believeth, or in modern English, believes. It's the present tense, continues to believe. And if you study the Greek text, a Greek present tense is always continuous. It's ongoing. When the Greek uses the present tense, it means something that continues to happen. If they're going to talk about just one event, they would put it in the past. But when they're talking about something that's ongoing or continuous, they put it in the present. And notice, we go from faith to faith. It starts in faith, it continues in faith, it ends in faith. And notice, the just shall live by faith. Not just one point in time, but a way of life. And it's very important to understand that faith is a relationship of trust in Jesus Christ. We are saved as we continue in relationship with Jesus. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through verse 10. This is a well-known passage of Scripture, and it's very beautiful. But it has a deeper meaning than what some may understand. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through verse 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So what this is telling us, salvation begins in God's grace. That means salvation is a gift to us. It's free. It's something we do not deserve. If you're asked, what is the definition of grace? Probably the definition you've heard is unmerited favor. In other words, something you receive that you did not deserve. And that's very true. Actually, grace is more active than perhaps that definition 
would suggest grace is God's work in us. It's not our work. It's God's work. Grace doesn't uh, eliminate the fact that something really happens to you. But grace, what that means is it's not your work to save yourself. It's God's work in you to save you. So grace is a, means that salvation is a free gift of God. We cannot earn it. We cannot deserve it. We cannot purchase it. We cannot do enough good works to demand that God will save us. If you were to say, uh, if you were to go to heaven and uh, someone, an angel or someone would ask you, why should you be allowed to enter? You don't really say, because I did this and I did that. You say, because Jesus Christ died for my sins. And of course, we must apply that to our lives, and we're going to talk about that. But we must understand that salvation always starts in God's grace. It's a gift. And the only way to receive a gift is by faith. Now, if it's something you deserve, something you've earned, then you can demand it. If you worked, um, you know, for two weeks and you're supposed to get a paycheck and you don't get the check, you can go sue that person and demand it because it's your right by law. You earned it and they owe it to you. But if it's just a gift, if somebody says, come to my house, I want to give you a gift, how do you receive a gift? You cannot sue the person for a gift. The only thing you can do is open your hand and receive it. Okay? So salvation is by grace through faith. God decides to give us a gift, and he purchases it, purchases that gift by the blood of Jesus Christ, which is his own blood, according to Acts 20, 28, the church that he has purchased with his own blood. And so how do we receive the gift of salvation? Open our hearts. That's all we can do. And that's called faith. You see, faith is our positive response to God's grace. Faith means trusting in God instead of trusting in ourselves. Faith means we don't boast of what we've done. We boast of what Jesus Christ has done at Calvary. Faith is trusting in God. It's relying upon God. It's commitment. Now, faith is more than mental assent. And it's more than verbal profession. Many people equate faith just with a change of your thinking or a statement of faith. But that alone is not faith. It's much more than that. You know, in the English language, we can use the word believe. It can be a very weak word because if you look outside and the, the sky is dark and overcast, cloudy, and you can say, I believe it's going to rain. When you say, I believe it's going to rain, that's just an opinion. It's not a commitment. It's not, I have faith it's going to rain. It's, I believe. Some people, when they talk about believing on Jesus, they think it means to have an opinion about Jesus. But that's not enough. You can find a drunken man and say, do you believe on Jesus? Maybe he was raised in a Christian home. He says, yes, I believe in Jesus. But he's not saved. He is bound by alcohol at that moment. His mental acknowledgement does not save him because he is not acting upon it. You know, when Jesus called the early disciples that were fishermen, he says, cast aside your net, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. When he said, come, follow me, what if they would have waved at him from the boat? Oh, Jesus, we believe you. You're the Son of God. You're the Savior of the world. You're the Messiah. And what if they were kept fishing? Would they have become his disciples? No. Only in the act of obedience did they become his disciples. The only way they became his disciples, disciples is they cast aside their nets and they started walking after Jesus. That's how they became his disciples. Faith is only real in the act of obedience. There's a well-known German theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he wrote, Only he who believes is obedient. 
and only he who is obedient believes. Now think about that. Only he who believes is going to obey. And only the person who obeys is the true believer. And it's very important for us to understand that. Uh, let me give you another example. How many people saw the resurrected Christ? Well, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, over 500 people saw Jesus at one time after his resurrection. Now, you would say they're believers. If you saw Jesus raised from the dead, you'd believe in him, right? They believed in him to an extent. But he gave them some commandments. He said, go back in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. How many people did that? Well, when you read Acts chapter 2, 1 and Acts chapter 2, 120 went to Jerusalem and waited in the upper room for the Holy Spirit to fall. Now, on the day of Pentecost, how many received the Holy Spirit initially? Was it the 500 who believed? No, it was the 120 who obeyed. Now, I hope some of the rest of those came in later that day as part of the 3,000 after they heard their friends telling them, hey, this is real. You should have been here. But my point is, it's not what you see and what you believe in your mind, but it's what you believe so much that you act on. That's what counts when it comes to saving faith. Saving faith is only real in the act of obedience. You must rely upon what you believe in. Let me give you another illustration. It's a true story many years ago. Perhaps you've heard of Niagara Falls in the United States and Canada. It's a huge waterfall. And years ago that various circus performers would come at, at Niagara Falls and they would draw great crowds, particularly the tightrope walkers, you know, the people that they would stretch a wire over the falls. And they, these uh, performers, these acrobats, they would walk on this wire over the top of the falls. If they slipped, it would mean instant death. So thousands of people would gather to see this amazing sight. Well, one day, one of the most famous of these performers, he took a wheelbarrow and he said, I'm going to push this wheelbarrow, this you know, one-wheel cart, I'm going to push it along in front of me as I walk on the tightrope. How many want to see that? Well, everybody, yes, yes, yes. He said, do you really think I can do it? If you think I can do it, I'll do it. But you must have faith in me. You must believe me. How many people think I can do it? Everybody, yes, 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 yes. You can do it. You can do it. Do it. We want to see it. He said, okay. Why don't you come? You get in the wheelbarrow. I'll push you along. No. Well, you believe me. You said I could do it. This will be a wonderful story to tell your grandkids. Come on, get in. But nobody would get in the wheelbarrow. You see, it's one thing to believe just standing there with your arms folded saying, yes, I believe, I believe, I believe. But it's another thing to commit your life to what you believe. Now, when the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, does it mean stand on the sidelines and say, yeah, I believe Jesus, yeah, I, th I believe in him? Or does it mean to commit your life to what you believe? Obviously, it means to commit your life. So faith is, means trust. It means reliance. It means commitment. It's more than verbal, a mental assent. It's more than verbal profession. It is obedience to what you believe. If, if, uh, if you believe Jesus, you must believe his words. Can you say, well, Brother Bernard, I believe you. I just don't believe what you're saying. You can't do that. If you're going to believe me, you have to believe what I say. And if you really believe what I say, you will act on what I say. If I start yelling, there's a fire, there's a fire, there's a fire in the building. If you really believe me, what are you going to do? Are you going to sit there and say, oh, well, thank you for that information? <laughs> no, you're going to run. You're going to save yourself. You're going to act on what you believe. You know, remember that $1,000 that I stole from Brother Willoughby last night? <laughs> I still have it. So if I say, 
the first person that comes and shakes my hand, I'll give you $1,000. If you really believe me, what are you going to do? I'm assuming everybody could use $1,000 here. You'd come shake my hand. And if nobody comes and shakes my hand, that means you really didn't believe. Because faith is proven to be true or real in the act of obedience. You act upon what you really believe. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit more that when you really believe, you'll repent of your sins. You'll be baptized in Jesus' name. You'll receive the Holy Spirit. You'll have an experience of being born again. Now, some people say, oh, no, that's impossible. That's salvation by works. I say, no, that's salvation by faith. Because when you repent, God is the one that's changing your heart. How does a person repent? God draws them, right? They begin crying as they hear the preaching of the word, perhaps. Why are they doing that? Because the Spirit of God is moving upon them. Now, a human can make, um, can make a decision, can make a New Year's resolution. A human can try to reform himself. But a human cannot repent by his or her own ability. That is an act of God to change your heart. You can hear the Word of God and open your heart, but really God has to do the work inside of you. You have to be willing, but God is the one who really does it. Same way with water baptism. When you're baptized in Jesus' name, is that a work of man? No. You can go bathing or you can go swimming and you just get wet. But God is the one who washes away your sins. That's why we call on the name of Jesus. It's not our works. It's not the preacher's works. It's Jesus who's doing the work. And if he doesn't do it, we're not going to have our sins washed away. When you receive the Holy Spirit, can anybody receive the Holy Spirit by your own works? Can anybody purchase the Holy Spirit, live a good enough life to deserve the Holy Spirit? No. It's all we can do is open our heart. But God is the one who fills us. So from start to finish, it's not our work. It's God's work in us. But to receive it, we must have faith, and that faith must be obedient faith. Can you have a disobedient faith? That doesn't make sense. If you believe God, you'll believe His Word, and if you believe His Word, you'll act according to His Word. You'll do what His Word says. So, we're saved by faith, but it is an obedient faith. Let me give you an example. Let's go back to this money story. Okay, I'll say, look, uh, meet me at the bank downtown, 10 o'clock in the morning. I'll give you $1,000. Okay? You didn't deserve it. You didn't work for me for a month or anything like that. I'm just promising this to you. So that's the doctrine of grace. It's a free gift from me to you. It's my grace. If you show up at the bank tomorrow morning, at 10 o'clock, you meet me, I give you the money, then that's an example of grace. But it's also an example of faith on your part. You believed me, and so you showed up and you received it. Now, what if you say, oh, no, he's not going to do that. He's not going to really give me the money. Then you won't show up. And so if I'm there at the bank at the appointed time and you never show up, I can say, well, didn't really, didn't really believe me. Because if you believed me, you would be there to receive your money. If you don't believe, you're not going to bother. You're not going to act. So your faith is shown not but what you, by what you say, but by what you do. Jesus gave a parable of two sons. The father asked the two sons to do work for him. And one said, he went out and changed his mind. He never did the work. The other son said, no, I'm not going to do what you ask. But later he repented. He thought better of it. He went out and he did the work. And Jesus asked, which one of those two did the will of the Father? Obviously, it's not the one who said, I will, but it's the one who actually did the work, who actually performed what the Father asked him to do. So that shows us that faith, what you profess alone is not what's important. It's what you do in response to what you believe that's important. Jesus said in Luke 6:46, "Why do you call me Lord? Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I ask, that I say?" 
In other words, it's not those who say Jesus is Lord that really believe in him as Lord, but it's those who obey his will. They are the ones who believe in Jesus as Lord. So going back to my little story, if, if you show up at the bank and you receive the money, you receive that money by my grace. You didn't deserve it. It's a gift. But you received it because of your faith. If you don't show up, then your lack of faith caused you not to receive it. So that doesn't mean you earned the money. Just by showing up at the bank, you didn't earn the money. But you met the conditions that I gave. So I look at repentance the same way and water baptism the same way. When, when I baptize someone, they have not deserved for their sins to be washed away. Washed away. They haven't earned that right. They weren't crucified on the cross. But they're just showing up. They're meeting the conditions. When, when they get baptized, they're saying, Okay, Lord, here I am. Your word says to be here that you would wash my sins away if I would show up. So here I am. I'm waiting for you to do the work. So salvation is by grace through faith. But it must be an obedient faith. And of course, uh, we can say that obedience is necessary to salvation. Now, some people would not like to, to, make, to, to say that, but it's very scriptural. Obedience is necessary to salvation. Let me give you some examples. John 14, 15. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So obedience is a test of love. Another good example is in Romans chapter 6, verse 17. Now, Romans is a great book of faith. Many people know that. In fact, we read at the, in the beginning, Romans 1, 16 through 17, that er, salvation comes to everyone who believes. All right? The same book, the same author, the Apostle Paul, he writes in Romans 6 and verse 17, But God be thanked that you were, past tense, the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And then he goes on to say you're, you've been made free from sin. So here in this passage he says, you were formerly the slaves of sin, but now you have been set free. You have been saved from sin. How? By obeying the doctrine. Now, which statement is true? In chapter 1, he says you're saved by believing the gospel. In chapter 6, he says you're saved by obeying the doctrine. Is that a contradiction? Of course not. It's the same. If you really believe the gospel, you will obey the gospel. It's like a coin. Belief and obedience are two sides of the same coin. If you really believe, you will obey. And so this great book of faith tells you what kind of faith we're talking about. An obedient faith. And in fact, if you read through the book of Romans, you'll see it's all throughout there. Romans chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, the whole purpose of Paul's ministry is to bring people to the obedience of faith, to bring for obedience to the faith among all nations. So the very book that talks about being saved by faith makes it very clear it's an obedient faith that he's talking about. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9 tells us that Jesus Christ became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So you can say, if you want to be saved, you must obey Jesus Christ. You can say, you must believe Jesus. You must obey Jesus. It's really the same thing. Hebrews chapter 11, it's known as the faith chapter. Everybody knows the book of Hebrews chapter 11 as the, the heroes of faith. But I want you to notice the kind of faith they had. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Now here he was counted as righteous or justified 
By faith. He received righteousness by faith. Now, according to some people, that means you don't obey. You just say, I believe. But let's look at the story of Noah. God said, I'm going to send an, a flood to destroy the world. So you, you need to build a boat and get in that boat and you will be safe. And so what did Noah do? He obeyed God. When the water came, the ark floated. It's very interesting. The same water that drowned the unbelievers, that same water lifted the boat above destruction. It was like a test. Now, the actual um, instrument of salvation was the ark. But the water made the ark to float. If the ark had not floated, it would have been covered and they would have drowned inside the ark. But the ark was the, the water lifted up the ark. So the same water that drowned the unbelievers saved the believers. Now, if you want to make a comparison, I would say Jesus is the ark of our salvation. But there is a test of obedience. If you're going to obey the gospel, for example, the Bible says be baptized in Jesus name. And that's why first Peter chapter three and verse 21 says the like figure, uh, it's just talking about Mo, uh, I mean Noah in the ark. It says that, that, uh, the like figure where we're saved by baptism, not that baptism is our savior, but it's like the, the water of Noah's day, it's the test of faith. If you obey, then you enter into the ark of your salvation. But if you refuse to obey, then you stand there and drown. Now, let's go back to this point in Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. It's saying that Noah was received the righteousness which is by faith. But how did it happen? Because he obeyed God and he built the ark. Now, what if Noah would have said this? Lord... I'm going to be saved by my faith. I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to believe on you. I'm not going to build an ark. That's work. That's too much work. That would be salvation by works, God. I'm just going to trust in you. What would have happened? He would have drowned. Because your faith is proven to be real by obedience. You can't do it your way. You've got to do it God's way. He's the one that's saving you. So you do what he tells you to do. So in the Old Testament, the Bible is very clear. Noah was saved by faith. But what kind of faith? A faith that obeyed God's word. Now, Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. So if you look at that sentence, the main sentence, you take out all the other clauses, what it says, by faith, Abraham obeyed. So, you, know, you, don't, you cannot say, I will believe instead of obeying, but I believe by obeying. That's how I believe, is by obeying the word that I believe. Go a little bit further in Hebrews 11 and 28, talking about Moses and the, and the Israelites. Hebrews eleven twenty eight 28, through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So when they were in Egypt, God said, you kill a lamb and you sprinkle the blood on the doorpost. And when I see the blood, I will pass over that house. But if there's no blood, then I will enter that house. The death angel will kill the firstborn. Now, what if the Israelites had said, oh, Lord, we're going to believe in you. We're going to trust in you. We're not going to kill a lamb. We're not going to put blood on the doorpost. That's too much work. We're just going to believe you. What would have happened to that house? The death angel would have entered and would have killed the firstborn. So by faith, they sprinkled the blood. They applied the blood. The same is true today. If we believe, we will apply the blood of Jesus to our hearts. So... Saving faith includes obedience to God's word. If you don't obey, you'll be judged. Notice in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, it talks about Jesus Christ is coming back in flaming fire. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. He will come back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here it's very clear in Scripture. If you do not obey the gospel, you will not be saved. You will be judged. You must obey the gospel. Now, let me summarize where we are right now. We're saved by believing the gospel. But that means the same thing as obeying the gospel. If you believe the gospel, you will obey the gospel. If you do not obey the gospel, then you don't have true faith. You must obey the gospel. And I have a definition of saving faith. Saving faith has two parts. Accepting Jesus as the sole means of our salvation. But that's only half. Uh, for many people, that's all they think of. Well, accept Jesus. Believe on Jesus. Make a decision for Jesus. But it must go beyond your mental understanding. Yes, you must mentally understand that Jesus is your Savior. And you must agree to that. But then you must apply that truth personally to your heart by obedience. So that's the second part. And that is applying the gospel personally by obedience. So you, you must accept Jesus as the Savior, but then you must obey the gospel. You must obey what he says is for your salvation. So how do you do that? Let's go a little bit further. Let's talk about the gospel. The word gospel, does everybody know what it means? What does it mean? Good news. So what's the good news? Well, I'll, I tell people there's good news and there's bad news. You've heard that those jokes, haven't you? Before I can tell you the good news, I have to tell you the bad news. So, um, you know, it's um, one of these things where I guess we want to hear the good news, but we don't really want to hear the bad news. Um, but the bad news is all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. Every human being has sinned. The bad news is the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23. That's the bad news. Every one of us deserves to die for our own sins. But the good news is that Jesus Christ died in our place. Jesus, as God manifest in the flesh, took our sins upon himself on the cross. He died for our sins. He was buried in the tomb. The burial is very important because it shows that the death was real and final. And it also shows that what happened next was real. Because when they saw that tomb empty, they knew that Jesus had arisen from the dead. And Jesus arose bringing victory. If we only had his death, that would be a defeat, not a victory. But when he arose, he won the victory over death, over sin, over the devil. Amen. Christianity is the only religion that depends on the death of its founder. And Christianity is the only religion that depends on the resurrection of its founder. Amen. In fact, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this will be the gospel in a nutshell, a simple statement of the gospel. If anyone asks you what the gospel is, here, here you can show them. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received. So this is the same gospel that, that all the apostles preached that's been handed down. And wherein ye stand, verse 2, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now that verse is one reason why I don't believe in the so-called doctrine of once saved, always saved, or unconditional eternal security. You make one decision, and then you never think about it, and you live any kind of life, and you're still saved. No, you must continue to believe. It's possible to believe but in vain. If you start in faith and do not continue in faith, you will believe in vain. But you have to keep this in your heart. You have to keep it in your memory. All right? So what is the gospel that will save you if you keep it? 
Verse 3 and verse 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So here is the simple gospel. Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, in order to be saved, you must believe that gospel. So you might say, well, I believe Jesus died. I believe He was buried. I even believe He arose. But just believing that in your mind does not save you. As we've already seen, faith is only real in the act of obedience. So somehow you must apply that truth to your life personally. How do you obey the gospel? How do you apply it personally to your life? Remember, we read the scripture, judgment is going to come on everyone who does not obey the gospel. So you can't just say, I believe it in my mind, I accept that truth in, in my mind. You must obey it. You must put it into practice. You must apply it to your life personally. How do you do that? Well, the answer is found in Acts chapter 2. If you go to Acts chapter 2, you know the story, how the disciples and other believers, a total of 120, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, that's a good point for the Catholics to see, because Mary, whom they honor so much, she followed the same pattern that we're explaining right now. They gathered and they waited. The Holy Spirit fell. And you know on the day of Pentecost, the the Spirit of God came upon them. There was a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. That was a sign that the Spirit was now available. They had been waiting for the promise, but when they heard the wind, that probably reminded them of the words of Jesus that he gave in John chapter 3. The wind blows where it wants to. You can't see it, but you can hear the sound of it. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So when they heard that sound of wind, that was a sign. The Holy Spirit is now available. Wasn't available before, but now is available. And then the Bible says tongues sat upon each of them, tongues of fire. And so they saw these flames sitting on each person. That was a sign that the Holy Spirit was available for each person. Not just an experience that the group would receive, but every individual could receive it. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So what was the first sign of each person being individually filled? They began to speak with tongues. Now, We don't find the other signs uh, elsewhere in the book of Acts, but we do find the sign of tongues repeated. Why? Because once the Spirit had come, they now knew it was available. They now knew it was for every person. But how do you know that each person has received this experience? Well, the sign of tongues is the evidence or the proof that each individual is filled. And it's a beautiful sign because there are many signs of the Spirit of God moving upon a person. If you see one sh- somebody shaking under the power of God, you see someone laughing, uh, leaping for joy, crying, um, you know, dancing, you might say the Spirit of God is moving upon them. But how do you know the Spirit of God has filled them and taken control? But when you speak in tongues, it's not an outward sign coming in but it's an inward sign coming out in other words you speak from your heart you speak from your mind and so when you receive the holy spirit and begin to speak in tongues it shows the spirit of god has come inside and taken residence taken control and is using your mind and your tongue to speak through you so it's a sign of the abiding presence of the holy spirit speaking out from you it's a beautiful sign of being filled with the holy spirit so this wonderful event happened and uh, they, they begin worshiping God, apparently getting very excited and exuberant because the crowds gathered around and said, these people must be drunk. They're full of wine. And uh, some said they're just babbling and saying strange things. Others said, no, I understand what they're saying. They're, they're saying the language from the country where I live. But, but how can these people of Galilee know all these different languages of the countries that we've come from? And so they were amazed and asking, what does this mean? The Apostle Peter stood up. Now you can read this in Acts chapter 2. I'm just giving you a summary. The Apostle Peter stood up and all the other apostles stood with him. 
Acts 2.14. They were supporting his message. It wasn't just his message. All the apostles agreed. He said, these people are not drunk as you suppose, but this is the prophecy of Joel. In the last days, says God, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. This is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. It's God's spirit. So he identified this miracle of speaking in tongues as the fulfillment of receiving the Holy Spirit of the Old Testament. But if you'll notice, he continued quoting from Joel until he talked about the signs that will come in the end time. And the reason why he kept quoting, he wanted to get to this statement. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, it's interesting, if you go back to Joel, Lord is in all capitals. Whosoever shall call on the name of Jehovah shall be saved. But when Peter preached it, he used the Greek word kudios, meaning Lord. He was thinking of Jesus. So indirectly, there is an indication he was confessing that Jesus is Lord. Specifically, Jesus is the Jehovah of the Old Testament who will pour out his spirit. So notice what he did in quoting the prophecy of Joel. He started out with what the people were curious about, namely the speaking in tongues, the miracle. He said, this is the Holy Spirit. But he continued quoting from Joel until he got to the part that says, whosoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he began preaching about Jesus. You see, he wasn't trying to preach about tongues or even the Holy Spirit as such. He was using that as a hook to bring them to where he wanted to go because he wanted to preach to them about Jesus. Now, if you study his message, he preaches about the death of Jesus. This man, Jesus, he went around doing miracles by the power of God. Maybe you didn't fully understand who he was, but you should have known that he was doing works by the power of God. You should have listened to him. But instead of listening to him, you killed him with wicked hands. You crucified him. And you thought that was the end of it, but that wasn't the end of it. There's a prophecy of the Psalms. You will not let your Holy One see corruption. When his body was placed in the tomb, it did not decay like all other human bodies. But God preserved it from decay. And then, God came, the God's Spirit came back into that lifeless body of Jesus and raised him from the dead. The same Jesus that you crucified, God has raised him up. And he is now both Lord and Christ. Now notice, what did he cover? The death the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The simple gospel message. That's what he preached. The first sermon of the New Testament church on the day of Pentecost. It was the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So that's Acts 2.36. Well, what was the response? In Acts 2.37, they were convicted of their sins. They were pricked in their heart. And they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? So they're asking all the apostles... Now, according to some people's doctrine, Peter should have answered, don't do anything. You can't be saved by works. Don't do anything. You've already changed your belief while you were listening to me, so go home. You're already saved. That's what he should have said, because obviously they changed their belief. Because now they, they were convicted of their sins. They realized they'd done wrong. They realized Jesus was the Messiah and the Lord. They, they realized that while he was preaching. So, according to many people's doctrine... He should have said, oh, I can see you've already changed your thinking about Jesus. You now believe on, on Him as the Lord and the Messiah, so don't do anything. You're all saved. Go home. And live like you want to, because once saved, always saved. But He didn't say that. He said, oh, and I'm paraphrasing, of course. I'm giving you the, the way He's thinking. Oh, so you now believe what I said. You didn't accept him before, but now you, you believe that he is the Lord. Well, okay, now you need to obey him. And so in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 39, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So he said, This is for everyone. And somebody said, well, how can you prove it's for everyone? Well, 
He says, repent and be baptized every one of you. And then when he talks about the promise of the Holy Spirit, it's for everyone that God calls. So if, if you feel the call of God upon your life drawing you, that's proof that God wants to give you the Holy Spirit. It's for everyone. And, of course, when we repent, we're dying to sin. Repentance is a turn. It's a change. If you're walking this direction, you turn 180 degrees and you walk that direction. That's repentance. So repentance is a death to the old life, to the old man, the old person. And then we're baptized. In fact, Romans 6, 4 says we're buried with Jesus Christ in water baptism. Just as a person dies, then we bury that person. So a person dies to sin and repentance, we bury them by water baptism in Jesus' name. And then when you receive the Holy Spirit, you are receiving the spirit of the resurrected Christ. We rise to walk in newness of life. We don't serve in the oldness of the letter. According to Romans chapter 7, verse 6, we don't serve in oldness of letter, but in the newness of spirit, the new way of the spirit. In Romans chapter 8, verse 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So how do we have the new life? It's through the spirit of Christ Jesus. So... We personally apply the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus to our lives through repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's how we obey the gospel. So let me give you just a little thought to help you here. When I talk to people of various denominations, Baptists and Methodists and all that, I don't tell them you're not preaching the gospel. But I say, if you are preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that's the gospel. That's the simple gospel message. And if you believe that and you're preaching that, great. But let me ask you, how do you obey it? You're supposed to obey the gospel. Not just believe it in your mind, but rely upon it. Apply it. Obey it. How do you do that? And of course, the answer is repentance. Baptism in Jesus' name, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's how you obey the gospel. So if you haven't obeyed it, you need to keep on going. I'm glad you started to believe, but you've got to continue. You've got to obey it. If you're going to believe in the scriptural sense, you can't just accept it in your mind. You've got to apply it to your lives by receiving Baptism in Jesus' name and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't have time tonight. I'm going to take a few more minutes here, and then we're going to go into questions. But what I want to emphasize, baptism in, in the, by calling the name of Jesus is the scriptural way to be baptized. There, If you study, actually, the whole Bible, if you look for historical accounts of how people were baptized in the New Testament church, you'll find it's in the book of Acts. There are nine accounts. Only five of them describe the name or the formula. And in every one of those five cases, it describes the name of Jesus. That's why we baptize in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the Jews were commanded to be baptized in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 8, verse 16, the Samaritans, who are part Jew, part Gentile, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. In Acts chapter 10, verse 48, the Gentiles were commanded to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And we know who the Lord is. Jesus is Lord. In fact, uh, other translations here say in the name of Jesus Christ. So every class of people, the Jew, the Samaritan, the Gentile, all were commanded to be baptized in Jesus' name. And you'll know... Now, according to the Bible, in the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses, let every word be established. So if we can show two or three accounts, that establishes the pattern for us to follow. And here's a pattern for all races of people. Now, if that's still not convincing, Acts chapter 19, there were some disciples of John who had already been baptized. But Paul commanded them to be baptized a second time. 
into the name of the Lord Jesus, Acts 19.5. What was the difference in their baptism? It was a new understanding of who Jesus was and calling on his name at baptism. That was the only difference. But it was sufficient for Paul to baptize them a second time in the name of Jesus. So I tell people, if you've already been baptized some other way, I don't condemn you, I don't attack you. In a world full of various religions that, and people that reject Christ, you made an effort by being baptized in some way to identify with Christianity. And I commend you for that. But now that you understand more clearly, do not be satisfied with the step you took in the past. If you believe on Jesus with all of your heart, you need to act in faith. And the way you act in faith is to take on the name of Jesus. So be baptized in Jesus' name. And so according to Acts 19, even if you've been baptized before, if you have not been baptized in Jesus' name, you should be baptized again, specifically to take on the name of Jesus. And then the fifth account, Acts chapter 22, verse 16, the Apostle Paul is giving his testimony. And Ananias told him to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And you remember, he had just asked, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. So Ananias said, call on his name. And the Greek word is very clear. It says invoking the name. So some say, well, you don't have to really say the name, you just think the name, as long as it's Christian baptism, of the authority of Christ. But the way that you invoke the authority of Christ is to call on his name. And so it's very clear that baptism is to be in Jesus' name. And then also, what about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? In the book of Acts, there are five historical accounts of people being baptized with the Holy Spirit. And when you study those accounts, you will find that the initial sign is speaking in tongues, speaking miraculously in languages that the person does not know by the power of God's Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. In Acts chapter 10, verse 44, the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit. The Jewish Christians at that time did not think that Gentiles could receive the Spirit. They thought the Gentiles would have to convert to Judaism, and then they could receive the Spirit. But to their shock and surprise, they watched the Gentiles receive the Spirit. How? What was the evidence that convinced them against their own will? It says, for they heard them speak with tongues. You know, if they would have jumped up and said, oh, I believe on Jesus, Brother Peter, I believe on Jesus. I have the Holy Spirit. They'd have said, sit down. No, you haven't. You're a Gentile. If they said, but I feel such joy. They said, no, no, no. You have to wait. But when they heard them speaking in tongues, they had to say, well, what can we say? They've received the same experience that we did. Praise God. In fact, in Acts chapter 11, Verse 15, you know, the Apostle Peter had to give account for why he would go and preach for Gentiles. And he went back to the elders and apostles in Jerusalem, and he gave his report. And he said, As I begin to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Now, wait a minute. There was no sound of a rushing mighty wind in Cornelius' house. There was no tongues like a fire that sat on each of them. The only thing that was the same was speaking in tongues. But that was enough for Peter to say they received the same experience that we did on the day of Pentecost. And that's how we can make the same confession today. How do you know that you've received the Holy Spirit like the early church? Because we've spoken in tongues just like the early church. So the Apostle Peter said, you know, I didn't lay hands on them. I didn't give them the Holy Ghost. I didn't try to pray them through. It's not my fault. While I was just preaching, God is the one who gave them the Holy Spirit. He says, who was I that I could withstand God? Am I going to stop God? I couldn't do anything else. But it's very interesting. In verse 17, this is Acts 11, verse 17. For as much as God gave them the like gift, 
as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. What was I that I could withstand God? Do you notice that? Who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, you know, we, when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, we received the Holy Spirit. They did the same thing. So here, the Apostle Peter is linking believing on Jesus with receiving the Holy Spirit. If you truly believe on Jesus, you will be led to this experience where you'll receive the Holy Spirit just as they did on the day of Pentecost. And then, so in the five accounts, you have Acts 2 and 4, you have Acts 10, 44, you have uh, again, Acts 19, the disciples of John at Ephesus, when they received the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that they spoke in tongues at that time, and that's Acts 19 and 6. And then the fourth account is back in Acts 8, the Samaritans. It does not name any sign, but we know there was a miraculous sign. Because the Bible says, that Philip went and preached in Samaria. There was great joy in that city. Uh, they believed. They were baptized. But the Holy Spirit had not fallen on any of them. Now that shows you that receiving the Holy Spirit is not to be equated with the moment of uh, believing with your mind and your understanding. It's not to be equated with repentance. Because you have to repent before you're baptized. They were already baptized, but they still didn't ha have the Holy Spirit. It's not to be equated with water baptism. It's not to be equated with having great joy. Because the Samaritans had received all of that. But somehow they knew they had not received the Holy Ghost yet. Why? They were waiting for a sign. Then when Peter and John laid hands on them, and said they received the Holy Ghost. How could they know for sure that none of them had the Holy Spirit before? But the moment Peter and John laid hands on them, how could they know for sure they all received the Holy Spirit right at that moment? There was some sign. And Simon, the sorcerer, the magician, he said, I want the power to be able to do this, that I can lay hands on people and they would receive the Spirit. Now, he was a magician. He was getting people to come to his shows. And they were paying money to come see him do this great thing. And he was willing to pay money to buy this power. Now, if people are just saying, oh, I feel so good. I feel such joy. I believe on Jesus. That would not have been the kind of impressive magical trick that Simon would want to purchase. But he saw some miracle that made him want to purchase this power. Well, Acts 8 doesn't say what the miracle is, but I'm showing you obviously there was a miracle that everybody observed. And when you study the other accounts, what is the miracle? The miracle is speaking in tongues. And then the final account is Acts 9, which says that Ananias came to pray for Paul, Saul of Tarsus, or Paul, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't describe how he was filled, but we do find later in 1 Corinthians Chapter 14 and verse 18, he says, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. So in the five accounts of people receiving the Holy Spirit, in three of them, we see that they spoke in tongues when they received the Holy Spirit. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. Three accounts is uh, sufficient to establish a clear pattern that we should expect. In the fourth account, the Samaria, we see that there must have been a miracle which we know is speaking in tongues. And in the fifth account, the Apostle Paul, we know also that he spoke in tongues. So it establishes the pattern. Now, let me summarize this by saying, if you truly believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will obey the gospel and be identified with the death, burial, and resurrection through repentance, water, baptism, and the Holy Ghost. And that comes from the teaching of Jesus Christ himself. Let me show you this. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, when Jesus began his ministry, this is what he preached. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So according to Jesus, if you're going to believe the gospel, what will you do? Repent. Okay? Now, also the words of Jesus, Mark 16, 16. Jesus said, 
He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So according to Jesus, if you believe, what's the next step? You will be baptized, and that will lead you to salvation. If you do not believe, you'll be condemned. Now, some people say, well, he didn't say if you're not baptized. Well, he didn't have to. Because if you don't believe, you're not going to be baptized. Or if some way you're just baptized without believing, it won't do you any good. Because believing is the key. Once you believe, everything else follows. So that's all he had to say. But if people are trying to use this to mean that baptism is not necessary, you would have to edit the words of Jesus. You'd have to change it to say, He that believeth and is not baptized shall be saved. But do you want to put a negative in the words of Jesus and make him say the opposite of what he said? That's a pretty dangerous thing to do. You just have to stick with the words of Jesus. So Jesus says, if you believe, then you're going to be baptized. That's, that's what's going to happen. And that will lead you to the experience of salvation. And then finally, in John chapter 7, verse 38, actually John chapter 7, verse 37 through verse 39, you know, Jesus cried out and said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, John 7, 38, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And then John explained in John 7, 39, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So they couldn't receive it at that time. They had to wait until the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. But since that time, the Holy Spirit is available to all who believe. So from the teaching of Jesus, we find if you believe, you will repent. If you believe, you will be baptized. If you believe, you'll receive the Holy Spirit. So it all fits together. That this is how we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Let's worship Him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for the beautiful message of salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if someone has never believed on Jesus, this is how you lead them. You say, all have sinned and we need a Savior. Jesus is the Savior. He died for us. He was buried. He rose again. Now you need to follow the same process. You need to die by confessing and repenting of your sins. Once you do that, we'll baptize you in Jesus' name. When you come up out of the water, you believe God. We'll lay hands on you. You praise God, and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. And actually, if you're praying already, you don't have to wait till you're baptized. God will go ahead and fill you with the Spirit now, and then we'll baptize you. Because God, once you believe, God's not going to stop and say, wait, nope, nope. He's going to keep going. As long as you keep going, He'll keep going. Praise God. And if you teach that to people, it's very easy for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Because they just, they don't know anything else. They just do what you say and they receive the Holy Spirit. If you're talking to people of other denominations, you say, we thank God for the, whatever experience with God that you have. We don't deny that. But we say, don't stop short of the apostolic pattern, but continue on to receive everything that God has for you. And some will say, were well, you condemning me to hell? I say, look, I'm not your judge. God is your judge. In all sincerity, I'm telling you, I'm not your judge, but I will tell you two things. Number one, I can tell you what the Bible says. And that's between you and God. You must obey the word of God. And number two, I can tell you my personal experience. I have received what the Bible says. And I would not be satisfied with anything less. So if I hadn't received everything, I would not stop until I obeyed what the Bible says. And so I give it to you, and it's up to you. And that's how we can share this message with everyone. Amen. And God will confirm His Word with signs following. Praise God. When they're baptized in Jesus' name, they will feel the difference. They will feel the cleansing. They will feel the power. When they receive the Holy Spirit, they will feel the difference. They will feel the power of God working in their life as never before. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Now.